next week.
We really need to understand.
Okay, so I just want to, uh, oh, I guess I need to pick this up. I think there might be a problem with the video. Where are you from? <laughs> Sandia. You're in Sandia. Usually we see Los Alamos people on that screen. But uh, it's nice to meet like you. Like me better this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? What did you they say? They like me better now. They like me better? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so um, <coughs> so I want to just continue going through some of the variety of NP-complete problems. Um, again, there's no point in trying to give anything like an exhaustive survey because there are thousands of them um, from many different places. But I just want to um, show a couple of... Uh, uh, a couple more examples. So first of all, in tiling, uh, so we talked about tiling regions with this shape, and I just waved my hands, and you can look at it in the book. I said, well, you know, what we'll do is we'll make these two tilings, either this one or this one, of a given wire That'll be our choice gadget that will represent true and false to us. Um, and of course, you know, notice that these two things are mirror images anyway, so I have to tell you which way the wire goes in order for you to interpret it as true or false. And then I said, well, you know, uh, if you take a square here in the center and you stick these wires onto it, then just try it. And it does something like an AND gate, and um, and a couple of the things I, you know, it's worth saying that, again, are easier to prove in, in pictures than by, by some sort of silly formal proof. One is that these wires can be bent. That's important. I mean, we wouldn't want them to just have to continue in one straight line and not be able to move them around. So you can put little bends in them so that you can change from one direction to the other. And you can do this in a way that doesn't destroy its truth value. That's good. So we can bend the output of one gate around so that it feeds into another. Um, another thing which is important to be able to do is take a wire and split it into two so that each one carries the same truth value that that one did. And again, that's not too hard to do. You actually do something very much like this. Um, and we can also require that the output of some circuit be true by having a wire just end. And for instance, if it ends this way, then the only way you're allowed to tile it is like that. And that could correspond to forcing the output of the circuit being true. And finally, one of the things that, uh, that I should have said, which uh, is that so, okay, what do we have? We have these wires, they can carry truth values. We can bend them around, we can split them. We have an AND gate, we have an OR gate, and it's also not too hard to make a NOT gate, something which forces you to flip which of these two tilings you're using. Well, there's one thing missing, because um, if we're trying to claim that circuit satisfiability is... Uh, directly reducible to tiling, well, the problem is that all of this is laid out in two dimensions. So the one thing that we haven't described how to do is have one wire cross over another. Because when I say that I can reduce from one problem to another, I mean I can reduce all cases of this problem to some version of this problem. Well, and certainly not all circuits can be laid out in the plane without crossings. So what am I going to do about crossings? So um, it turns out that with AND, OR, and NOT gates, you can simulate a crossing with a planar circuit. So remember how in the case of three-colorability, we came up with this gadget 
which simulated two edges crossing. It was this thing with a bunch of internal nodes and vertices, I forget what, and it was planar. And so that allowed us to reduce the general case to the planar case. So here we can do something similar. So circuit sat reduces to planar circuit sat, which then reduces using our gadgets to the tiling problem. So um, I'll show you how this works to some extent. So we've so far only talked about and, or, and not gates. But another handy gate is an exclusive or gate. So I claim that if I have x here and y here, and I take their exclusive or, and this feeds out of there, and there's another exclusive or gate here, and another exclusive or gate here, that this will be y, and this will be x. And so I've just simulated a crossing. I've faithfully carried the truth value of x from there to there, and the truth value of y from there to there. Now, what I firmly intend to leave as an exercise is how do you build a planar circuit out of and, or, and not gates that carries out the exclusive or gate? If you can do that, then we're done. Um, as I remember from my architecture test back in those days, any circuit can be converted and it can be done using only XOR gates. Only XOR gates? I disagree. Any circuit no, no, not, can X, be done using XOR gates. Any circuit can be done with NOR gates. Yeah, no, no, X, X or, so ex, this means exclusive or. or exclusive. It means uh, its output is true if exactly one of the two inputs is true. No. One or the other, but not both. So, oh, but what I'm saying is that if you can build that gate out of these no. in a planar way without crossings, then you just need to sort of use those, those things in place of each of these three XORs and then you will have a planar circuit of and, or, and not gates, which simulates a crossover. OK. All right. So you know, yes, it is, that is a little exercise in hardware design. Um, uh, OK, good. There's one other technical point here that maybe you've noticed and maybe you haven't. Um, it deserves to be noticed, but not to actually be addressed. So the technical point is that if I have a circuit with n gates, you might question, I mean, when I convert it to a region which I'm going to try to tile, I need to make sure that the total size of that region, its height and its width, is only polynomial as a function of n. And this is a layout design problem, right? I mean, the question is, if I have n gates, you know, it's going, I might have some difficulty packing them in in the plane in the right way, and then I'm going to need to make the wires between them fairly long, whatever, okay, to, to get around other things and so on. And we need to make sure that the total number of squares in all of this, the gates and the wires, is just polynomial as a function of the size of the original circuit. So, like I said, that deserves to be noticed because we need to make sure that when I convert a circuit into an instance of tiling, that I get an instance of polynomial size. But this is also kind of a, you know, I think this also deserves to be swept under the technical details rug. I'm not going to go to the trouble of proving that we can lay these things out polynomially, but you should notice that it's required for the reduction to work. <clears throat> okay, so any questions about tiling? Just for kicks, let me mention two other things. One is that, um, as you can see, when you uh, convert a circuit into a region here, this region consists of these long stringy wires with lots of holes in between. Okay? So, as a topologist would say, these are not simply connected regions. They have holes. So you could ask, all right, well, let's look at the special case of tiling, 
where I guarantee that the region R that I'm trying to tile, whatever it is, has no holes. Is it still NP complete? No one knows. So, yeah. um, that's a special case which might somehow be easier. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that in three dimensions, even if your only tiles are little sticks made of two cubes and little sticks made of three cubes, tiling is NP-complete in three dimensions. I think that's kind of cute. And finally, um, you know, since I said, well, tiling is hard even if our only tiles are these little trominoes and this square tetromino. And then I said, well, the proof is trickier, but you can actually get rid of these. So just telling whether you can tile a region with that shape is NP complete. Um, you might wonder, well, is that the simplest? Well, pretty much the only tile simpler than this is the domino. So, and those of you who've been doing your reading already know the answer. Uh, suppose I have a region and um, of the square lattice, and I want to know whether it can be tiled with dominoes. Do you think this problem is NP-complete? <coughs> So dominoes are just one by two and two by one rectangles. True volume must be some property, like like Julian passed. If the area has an odd number of of spaces, then you you can't tile the whole thing. So there's a few cases where that's true. But of course, that's not sufficient in and of itself. There's a classic puzzle. It's in children's puzzle books. You take an 8 by 8 chessboard or checkerboard, and you remove this corner and this corner. And now I ask you whether the remaining 62 squares can be covered with dominoes. There's 62, so there's an even number. But it turns out that there's no way to do this. Does anyone know why? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, every domino has to include one black square and one white square, but I just removed two squares of the same color. Okay. So now there are there's an imbalance. Okay. Well, I claim that that alone, though, is still not quite enough. I claim that there are regions with an equal number of white and black, which still cannot be covered with dominoes. Um, so, uh, yeah. I mean, here's an example. So four white and four black, but it can't be colored with dominoes because as soon as I try to put one, say, here, I've blocked off this square. Okay, so it's not obvious how to solve this problem. I claim that we have already seen in this class a polynomial time algorithm for this problem. Think, think, what could he mean? Which, which one? Yeah, it's, it's like the unit path here. I mean, reduce it to the graph. The white is inside. The white is input. The black is output. Come out there. The white is input. The black is output. And then what? And there must be paired for for one. Yes. So what's another way to talk about a domino tiling? It's a perfect matching. Oh, okay. just so. Uh, let's invent a graph with vertices in the center of these squares. Here, let me do this larger. So um, here's a, a two by three region. Let's invent a graph 
you could call it the, you might call it the dual graph of this. So it is six vertices. And then a tiling of this, of this region with dominoes, like this domino, this domino, and this domino, corresponds to a perfect matching in this graph. So the idea is that take all the black vertices and put them on one side, and all the white vertices and put them on the other side. Okay? And say that a black vertex and a white vertex form a compatible couple if they're neighbors. Well then, a domino tiling is a perfect matching. And we already saw a polynomial time algorithm for telling whether a bipartite graph has a perfect matching by reducing it to max flow. So this problem is in P, but it's not totally trivial. Um, and uh, it's not quite as simple as counting squares or telling whether there's an equal number of white ones and black ones. Good. So in, in some sense, this is the, the best we could hope for if we're trying to show that tiling is really hard. You know, the best we could hope for is a little tile made of three squares instead of two. Um, the other one we could have in mind is a, a straight tromino, and tiling with these is also NP-complete. So I'm going to leave it to you whether you think that this boundary between two squares and three squares, between P and NP, is the same two versus three as between two sat and three sat, or two coloring and three coloring, I don't think it really is. Um, but in each of these problems, there's a kind of threshold where, you know, when we're really only dealing with pairs of things and interactions between pairs of things, somehow there's a polynomial time algorithm. And once we have three or more interacting, it gets trickier. And this is not some sort of general rule, um, but it seems to crop up in a couple of different situations. What about the tile that, um, that touch each other by the side? You, know, uh, you mean tiles like this, calling this a tile? Okay. Is this what you mean? Yeah. Well, OK, this is some sort of strange tile. <laughs> I mean, you know, of course, you can think about all sorts of tiles with made of triangles and so on. So I think a student of a friend of mine showed that telling whether you can tile things with these is NP-complete. I mean, once you get the basic idea of building these circuits, anybody can do it. You know, just sit down and start doodling. And as soon as you find some of the basic building blocks, as soon as you have the building blocks of a computer in some sense, then you have NP completeness, roughly speaking. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's move on to some other types of problems. One that I uh, kind of skipped over is independent set. So remember, when we were going through our list of common problems in NP, we had independent set. And this was pretty much the same as maximum clique, because an independent set in a graph is a clique in its complement, where things are connected if they weren't connected before. And that's pretty much the same as a vertex cover, because the complement of an independent set is a vertex cover. So let's show that these things are NP-complete. Um, I'm actually, you know, I know that maybe some of you have seen these things before, and there are, there are certain reductions that are copied from textbook to textbook. So I copied a few of them. Like my, cop, my, reduction, my proof that a Hamiltonian <laughs> path is NP-complete is stolen directly from Sipser. I, I couldn't find a better one. It's, it's really very nice. But for independent set, I found a cute one. So, so remember that three coloring is uh, um, is NP complete. I'm going to prove that independent set is NP complete by reducing to it from three coloring. And I know that I sound like a broken record, but what that means is I have to be able to take any graph G and convert it to an instance of independent set. So what is an instance of independent set? It's a graph G prime, to distinguish it from this one, 
and an integer k. And the question is, is there an independent set of size k uh, or greater? But if there's one of size bigger than k, then take any subset of it of size k, and then there's one of size k. Okay. So, um, so we can just ask the yes or no question, is there one of size k? So I want to convert a graph G into a new graph G prime and an integer k, such that G prime has an independent set of size k if and only if G is three colorable. All right. So again, if you've done the reading, you already know the answer. But here, here's the idea. I again, I again need choice gadgets and constraint gadgets. But now, because I'm reducing from a coloring problem, I don't want my choice gadgets to have choices that mean true or false. I want them to have choices that mean, say, red, blue, or green. OK? And now my constraint gadgets, instead of being like a 2SAT or 3SAT or NAE SAT clause, are going to be two neighbors can't have the same color. So remembering that an independent set is a set uh, that doesn't contain any neighboring pair of things, give me a little gadget, a tiny gadget, <coughs> where there are three different independent sets. And the idea is that which one we use will correspond to coloring a vertex red, blue, or green. So here's a vertex, and it's going to be red, blue, or green. Or I guess red, green, and blue, I'm supposed to say. Um, so I want to replace this with a little gadget consisting of a couple of vertices, perhaps, with a couple of edges, which has three different independent sets. And then which one I take will correspond to this being red, blue, or green. So give me a little gadget with three different independent sets, which are the largest possible. Feel free to toss something out there. You don't have to do it all in your head. <laughs> Maybe something involving three triangles, and those triangles are connected in some way. Do we need that much? Or just one triangle? Let's start with the triangle. Yeah. So what are the largest independent sets I can have on this triangle? The one. One of the vertices. So let's say I'm going to take this vertex, this vertex, or this vertex and which one I take will represent this vertex being red, blue, or green. Yeah. That's my choice gadget. Now suppose I have two of these triangles. I now need to represent the constraint that neighboring things cannot be the same color. How do I connect this gadget to this gadget so that they can't be, quote unquote, the same color? They can't use the same choice of independent set in both. Connect the, the same position, connect any yes, just connect all these things in parallel like this. Voila. So the point is that if this one, if, if our independent set includes this vertex here, it can't include this one. It could include one of these, one or the other, not both. And that corresponds to if this thing is red, this thing has to be blue or green. Now, of course, Independent set is a little bit different from colorability. It's an optimization problem, right? I mean, there always is an independent set, namely the empty set. The empty set does not have any neighboring members. Mm -hmm. So the question, I remember that I'm converting G not just to a graph, but to a graph and an integer. And that integer is my target size that I want the independent set to have. So what should that target size be? 
such that there is one of that size k if and only if this graph is three colorable. Let's give some names to things. I mean, let's say that G has n vertices and m edges. G prime has, is going to have three n vertices because we have a triangle for each vertex of G. It's going to have a bunch of edges. I guess it has three times n plus m edges for whatever that's worth. So what should K be? Remember, you get to choose k. We're designing a reduction. We're showing how to represent a three-coloring problem as an independent set problem. We get to choose what the graph is and what the target size of the independent set is. What should it be? How big is it if there is if G is three colorable? And we use this scheme to invent an independent set, how big is it? Number of triangles. And how many yeah, there's one in each triangle of G prime, and how many is that in terms of the original graph? Just, just N. Yes. Set K equal to N. Now we're done. We might not be totally done with a formal proof. So let's do a formal proof. So, so what's the claim? <clears throat> the claim, I mean, let's suppose that G is this graph here. I mean, this is going to be a real proof, not a proof by example, but it helps to have an example to look at. If this is G, then G prime is going to look like this with these things wired up like this. <coughs> and so on. Okay. So let's prove that if G is three colorable, so then G prime has an independent set of size n, where n is the number of vertices in G. We just need to prove, we need to prove if and only if for this reduction to work. We need to make sure that the answer to this question is yes, if and only if the answer to this question is yes. Well, first of all, if G is three colorable, prove to me that G prime has an independent set of size n. Just pick in one color. Yeah, I, well, sorry, what? I mean, so if, if G is three colorable, it has a three coloring. Yeah. Let's take one of them. Yeah, just take one. So color. let's say red, green, blue, green, blue. Okay. And then if in our gadget, the top vertex of each triangle means coloring that one red, and this one means green, and this one means blue. Well, those are the ones we take for our independent set. <clears throat> well, this set is certainly of size n, so if there's one in each triangle. We need to prove it's independent. They cannot be the neighbor because you're the same color, right? Yeah, it's, it's independent because the only way is that two vertices in G prime are neighbors is if they're in the same triangle, mm -hmm. which none of these are because I took one per triangle, or if they're in the same place in two neighboring triangles. Mm -hmm. But that corresponds to these vertices being the same color. Okay, so we've proved one direction. Well, we're not quite done. If we're really going to follow this to the rigorous end, we're not quite done. We need to prove that if G prime has an independent set of size n, where n is the number of vertices of G, then G is three colorable. Well, 
How do we prove that? Find the sun, eleven and set, color, color is the same color. So the idea is that this proof worked by saying, well, if, it's, if G is three colorable, show me a three coloring. And from that three coloring, I can get an independent set for G prime of size N. We just need to be able to do the reverse. Show me a independent set of size N and G prime. I claim that that gives me a three coloring of G. Well, what do I need to prove? Why does it give me a three coloring of G? Find three different independent set, independent set of same size, and not, not necessarily the same size. If n is the number of triangles in G prime, and there is an independent set of size n, what can you tell me about that independent set? In a graph that looks like this, what do you know about it? Each triangle has at least one. Has all these oh, yeah. It has exactly one. Yeah. <laughs> because each tri no triangle can have more than one because there would be neighbors. But I've told you the set is size n. Okay. So that means there's exactly one per triangle. Okay. And that means that you can get a coloring out of it. We just need to make sure that that is a proper coloring, a legal coloring, where no two neighbors have the same color. <coughs> but that's, again, because these things are wired up in such a way so that if this set contained, say, this vertex and this vertex, the same position in a neighboring triangle, it wouldn't be independent. So there's one per triangle, so it corresponds to a coloring, and by the design of these parallel edges, it's a legal coloring. OK? So the two directions of the proof are just kind of symmetric to each other around the? In this case, they're kind of symmetric. It's not always quite this easy. you know. But in this case, the gadget, kind of by design, we end up saying pretty much the same things in both halves of the proof. It's not always that easy. But um, but we do, you know, to really prove that a reduction works, you need to prove that the answer is yes to this problem, if and only if it's yes to that one. And usually the way this works is, well, if there's a solution to this, we can convert it to a solution to that, and vice versa. Okay. So any any questions about the structure, of, you know, about what what we're obligated to prove? I hope it's also clear that because we're reducing from three coloring, this graph, whose three colorability we're thinking about, is an arbitrary graph. Our reduction has to work for any case of three coloring. Okay. This graph is a special case. Obviously, not you know most graphs don't have these triangles that are wired up in parallel. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean. In the same way for the tiling example, right? we converted arbitrary Boolean circuits to these very special stringy, wiry regions, which are tileable if and only if the circuit is satisfiable. So one way to think about a reduction is that you're showing that when you reduce a problem A to a problem B, you're showing that A is equi that, that the general case of A is equivalent to some special case of B. And when you need to prove uh, it's, uh, that if and only if you can take a special case of B to prove it to a general case of A, the same thing? Well, we're just trying to prove this if and only if for the example of B that, that our reduction gives us, okay. right? I mean, the idea here is that, well, most instances, if, if this is three coloring and this is independent set, well, um, I mean, as you can imagine, actually, because both of these are NP-complete, there are reductions in both directions. But don't think about that for a moment. All this reduction is claiming is that we can convert examples of three coloring into examples of independent set. That doesn't mean that every example of independent set corresponds to some example of three coloring. But to show that this mapping works, we need to show that it preserves both yesness and noness. Okay. 
so that when we apply it to a particular graph here, if the answer was yes before, it has to be yes here. If the answer was no before, it has to be no here. Okay. So we have to do the if and only if. For this special case of B. For this special case. Yes. Um, all right. So um, let's just do a couple more examples for kicks. So um, what about uh, what about integer partitioning? Um, so remember, this was this problem where I give you a string of integers, and I want to know. Um, so there are these two versions of it. So one is I give you a string of integers which correspond to this set of brass weights here. So subset sum asks whether there is a subset which totals to a certain amount. Okay? So that's like asking, you know, here's my balance and the two pans of the scale. I have something here. Um, <laughs> and is there a subset of my brass weights that I can put over here that exactly balances it? And then integer partitioning is a, is a slightly different problem. It says, can I divide my brass weights into two sets that balance each other out that have the same total? And last time we argued that um, actually these, when we talked about these things before, uh, I said that these two are pretty equivalent to each other. The equivalence is almost as easy as that between, say, independent set and clique and vertex cover. Um, I didn't totally prove it, and I'm not going to. But the idea is that um, you can get from, I mean, so it's easy to see that integer partitioning can reduce to subset sum, because what's the total we're trying to achieve? Half of the total. Half of the total. The other direction is very slightly trickier, but not much trickier. You just have to figure out a way to, um, if you have a set of weights and a target, you just need to figure out a way to add a new weight to the set so that you now have an integer partitioning problem. Obviously, that new weight will have something to do with the weight with the target. Uh, it might not be just the target. It depends a little bit. Um, so, but let's, let's for now, if you don't mind, let's accept that these are equally hard so that we can prove that either one is NP-complete. We can prove that they're both NP-complete by reducing a known NP-complete problem to either one of them. Okay. So let me give you two reductions for subset sum. First, I'll give you the one that Sipser and everybody else uses. So, so again, um, it's a little bit surprising at first that these problems are NP-complete because they don't sound as if they're about bits or colors. Uh, they're about integers. And in SAT and three coloring, there are many little constraints, right? These two can't be the same color. These two can't be. These two can't be. This clause has to be satisfied. So does this one. So does this one. Here, instead, there's just one big constraint. The total has to be equal to blah. So it feels like a very different type of problem. But it's actually not so different. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to start out with a slightly different variant of 3SAT. Um, which I will call 1 in 3 SAT. So we already saw 3 SAT, which wants at least one of the three things to be true. We saw NAE SAT, which wants one or two, but not all three of them to be true, because it doesn't want them all three to be true or all three to be false. Well, guess what? 1 in 3 SAT wants exactly one of them to be true. Okay? Exactly, exactly one. It, it does not want more than one. It wants exactly one. 
And so, you know, each clause again looks like a triple of things, but now we want exactly one of those three things to be true. Um, I'm even going to focus on what's called positive one in three set, so that there's no negation here. None of the variables are negated. Okay. Okay? Exercise. Prove that positive one in three set is NP complete by reducing to it from graph three coloring. <clears throat> After all, what does it say to say this vertex has to be one of these three colors? It can't be red and blue. It has to be one of them. Yes? Oh, uh, just to be clear, we have to be able to take any example of a three color and then cast it in terms of possible on a three set for, to prove that direction. You have to be able to take any graph, any, right, any, any example of the three coloring problem. This is, so I, I think that's what you meant, but I, because you might have meant something else, I just want to say, sometimes when people design reductions, they think about starting with a solution to the problem. That's not what you're transforming. You're not starting with a coloring of a graph. You're starting with a graph. Okay. okay. That's what you're transforming. Other way around. Well, uh, again, so you'll start with an arbitrary graph here and convert it to some special case of positive one and three set. And what do your clauses need to do? Well, they need to force each thing to be exactly one color and for neighboring things to not be the same color. And I leave the rest to you. Would it be okay to, like, for purposes of doing our homework, to start out with, like, an easy graph that you know is three colorable and then go that way and then try and make it more general? Well, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you're going to have some clauses corresponding to each vertex and some clauses corresponding to each edge. And you're going to be able to explain what those clauses do in terms of forcing things to happen with the vertices and edges. It's fine to illustrate it with a particular graph, but I'm not sure if you even need an entire graph to illustrate it with, if you get my drift. Um, okay, so, so let's pretend that you've already done this, so we know that this is NP complete. You might be starting to wonder, well, let's see, uh, at least one out of three, that's standard three set. Two or three out of three, that's NAE set. Exactly one out of three, no more, no less, that's one in three set. Are all of these NP complete? Most of them. <laughs> there are a few that aren't. So you might want to think a little bit about, for instance, what about majority? Okay. So what about the one that says, out of, in every clause, I want two or three, a majority of the three variables to be true. Do you think that's NP complete? Think about it. All right, but anyway, exactly one out of three, it is NP complete. So here's what we're gonna do. Well, yes, integers don't sound like bits, but then again, integers can be written out in binary, in which case integers are strings of bits. So let's suppose that I have a one in three sat formula, which looks like this. It says that at least one of x1, x2, and x4 has to be true. I'm sorry, I meant to say exactly one. Mm -hmm. And exactly one of x2, x3, and x4 needs to be true. And exactly one of x3, x4, and x5 needs to be true, okay? And yes, I'm, I'm illustrating with this example, but I hope, hopefully it will be clear what the general scheme is. So here's the idea. My choice gadgets are going to be, do I include this weight or not in the set? That's certainly a binary choice. So here is an integer with lots of bits. And this one will correspond to x1. And another will correspond to x2 and another will correspond to x3, and another will correspond to x4, and another will correspond to x5. 
Okay? So remember, in designing this reduction, you have to start with an arbitrary one and three sat formula, but you're designing an instance of subset sum, which means we get to design the weights and we get to design the target. So let's let's write down. So the question is, um, you know, we have this set of weights W1 through blah blah blah, and the question is, uh, let's call that S. Is there and so an instance is the set of weights and a target T, and the question is, is there a subset of S such that the sum of those weights equals T? Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this thing out in binary, and I'm going to use different parts of the binary expansion to represent different constraints. All right? Okay. So I want this constraint to, to say that I want to force this subset A to include exactly one of these three weights, x1 or x2 or x4. So what should I put? Let's say that constraint is going to go in this column. Okay, so what should I put in x1, x2, and x4, and in t to make that true? In t you should put 1. Yes, the total in this column should be 1. All right. And what should I put elsewhere? 1, 0, 0. zero. Uh, where do the zeros go? Like x2. Oh, you mean? I mean, for x1, x2, x4, this this column corresponds to this clause. So what what should I put here? Zero. Why? I mean, this clause is happy if I include x2 but not x1 or x4. Yeah, it's, it's one. So I, I think I should put a 1 here, but a 0 for x3. Yeah, okay. 1 for x4. Yeah. 1 for each thing that appears there. And similarly here, I would put x2, x3, x4. Those have to add up to 1. And x3, x4, x5 have to add up to 1. I'm not quite done. Why am I not quite done? Bitwise summation. Yeah, I mean, this would work if each of these things were really being summed separately. But if these are bits in a large number, then, well, what happens when you add things up? What can happen to the bits? You can't have them. They can get carried over into the higher order bits, right? So there's some danger that if I have many, many variables here, I could actually add enough of these together so that I get a total just from this column of something like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. OK? Well, I can prevent this by separating these things out with enough zeros, though. Right? Because the total number of variables here is n. And, if, and remember, I get to design these things. So if each one of these is just 0, 0, 0, all zeros, or all zeros and then a 1, then how many, how many zeros do I need to put here to prevent cheating, to prevent cheating in my reduction where it spills over into the next column? Log yeah, log n would do. But let's be generous. Make it n if you want. It's OK. okay. It's OK if this thing has size n squared instead of n. It's a huge number, but the number of digits is still only order n squared if I have n columns. Um, well, actually, if there are m, if there are n variables and m clauses, 
So I have m columns. But yes, I mean, log n certainly is enough. So this whole thing could be m times log n digits. I'm just trying to make the point that even m times n digits would be OK. The size as a function of the number of bits would still be polynomial. And now we're done. So I, I find this reduction almost disappointing. Right? It's saying that, well, we have this question involving addition of integers. What's interesting about addition of integers is that things do carry over. But we're going to prevent it from doing that by really separating these bits out. And once we separate them out, then I'm, I'm solving a bunch of problems about bits independently. All right. Well, maybe I find it disappointing, but who cares about my aesthetic opinion? As a reduction, it works. So this does allow us to convert uh, positive 1 and 3 sat into subset sum. And that proves that subset sum is NP-complete. Now, um, any questions about this reduction? Does it make sense? I mean, one solution here is just to take x4, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, well, anyway. Uh, now, if you remember when we were talking last week about subset sum, we showed that if the numbers, if all the weights are only polynomial, then subset sum can be solved in polynomial time using dynamic programming. Well, are these numbers only polynomial? These are exponentially large numbers. I mean, if m if m the number of clauses, it, it could be n or something. You know, it could be on the order of n. Well, these are n digit numbers, or m digit numbers, or m log n digit numbers. So they have many digits. OK, yes? How are you uh, enforcing the constraint t? Are you just adding the bitwise adding the columns of x1 through x5? That's the idea, but I mean, yeah, so, so the subset sum problem, an instance of the problem is a set of weights and an integer t. So we get to design that instance. We get to design t and the weights. And our goal is to design them so that there is a subset which sums to t if and only if the original 1 and 3 sat formula is satisfiable. I see. So if we get like... 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1 for that little parenthesized piece of T that we know that it can't satisfy that? That would be a different instance. I mean, that would be some other instance which would demand that three of these things be true instead of one. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, the reduction is this machine that we put in a, a 1 in 3 set formula on one side, we get an instance of subset sum out on the other side. That instance consists of all of these numbers, the weights and t. And we get to design that however we like. So again, yes, this is a very special case of subset sum. These weights and this t together give a special case of subset sum which encodes this one in three set formula. I, I guess all I'm saying is you just you add up all the x's and you compare it to t, and if it's not the same, then for that instance, then you can. Uh, <clears throat> um, are you talking about an instance of the problem or a proposed solution to that instance? Not sure. Yeah. So I mean, the idea is that a a solution to this to the subset sum problem is a choice of which weights we include in the set. A solution to the 1 and 3 set problem is a truth assignment for the variables. The idea of this reduction is that the variables which are true are the correspond to the weights that we include in the set. And then the fact that they sum to t turns out to make sure that exactly one of each of these triples is true. Am I? Yeah, I think we're saying yeah. the same thing. It's okay. just a little translation. To that. All right, okay. <laughs> so there's another cute reduction you could use from tiling. So just as a very simple example, um, let's suppose here is a little region that we're thinking about tiling. 
Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each cell in this region a weight like that. And the question is, can I, can I create this whole weight and then each possible location for a tile, like this tile, covers these three things, so we would give it a weight of 8 plus 16 plus 32, which is 56. And this a tile here, we would give a weight of 1 plus 4 plus 8 or 13. And so then the question of whether I can tile the region becomes like, can I, uh, can I get these weights together with that total? We again have to avoid the carrying problem because cheating here would be having tiles that overlap, but then having the having this, you know, like having two eights equal one sixteen or something like that. But again, I can avoid this cheating by instead of using powers of two, use powers of something bigger. Even use powers of n if you like, where n is the number of cells. That's another that's another reduction you can do. Um, so let's see. Um, let's just do a few more. Uh, yes. The dependent set, both of one and three side, is there anything in common? Oh, I'm sure you can find acute reduction f directly from one to the other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, again, we're building this tree. But this is the tree now going. Yeah, but I mean. The fact is, there are many, many choices of how to build this tree, right? So let's see. So what do we have so far? I mean, we have witness existence, and then we had circuit sat, and then we had three sat. And from that, we got NAE sat, and that gave us three coloring, and that gave us since they're equivalent to each other, independent set, vertex cover, and clique. <coughs> but circuit sat, if you first go through the planar version, gives you tiling. And um, uh, let's see, I claim that three coloring can give you one in three sat, and that that gives you integer partitioning and subset sum which are equivalent to each other. But of course, as you can imagine, there is also redu a, a, a not very hard reduction directly from 3SAT to 1 and 3SAT. So there are many, many choices of how to build this tree. And, and ultimately, all of these things can be reduced to each other. It's just a sort of question of, you know, which reductions are kind of the cutest and simplest to see. So is kind of always in cycle in this tree? I mean, well, all of these things are in NP, so ultimately, yes, all of these things could be converted to witness existence. And, so, and, and then back to, you know, all of these can be reduced, each of these can be reduced to all the others in polynomial time. They're all equally hard, yeah. at least from our current point of view. If any one of them is in polynomial time, they all are. Yeah, but so far we have only going in one direction, right? I mean, oh. we have a loop back and... Well, if you believe the initial argument that oh, witness existence oh, is NP-complete, then yeah. we can always loop back because there's some program that takes a proposed solution for subset sum and checks it. And if you feed that program to witness existence, then, yeah. Um, let's see. So, I mean, at, at the risk of uh, inducing numbness here, uh, Um, so here, here are some others that, I, that are maybe worth mentioning. One is um, max cut. So what's max cut? Um, so remember, remember our whole max flow min cut discussion. So min cut was, I have a graph 
and there are weights on these edges, and I want to separate this vertex from this vertex. I want to separate the vertices into two groups, but I'm going to have to pay for the edges that cross from one of those groups to the other, and I want to minimize that total cost. Well, max cut. Um, uh, the input is a graph G and an integer K. And the question is, um, so G is V comma E, is there a subset S in V such that there are K or more edges crossing from S to its complement. Okay. So, so for instance, the an extreme case where there's as a max cut as good as possible would be a bipartite graph. Right? Okay. In a bipartite graph there are two groups of vertices and every edge crosses from one to the other. In general, that's not possible. If a graph is not bipartite, like on a triangle, the best I can do is put one of these vertices in S, or two of them, and the other in S prime, and then I get a cut of size two, two edges crossing the cut. So this is a maximization problem. Well, it's NP complete. And there's a simple reduction, for instance, from NAE set. You can probably find lots of other simple reductions, too. Um, another one is uh, max sat. So max k sat. So the idea here is I'm, again, going to have a k sat formula with many clauses. But instead of asking, can I satisfy all of them, I'll ask, can I satisfy how many, what's the maximum I can satisfy? Or to t change it into a decision problem, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to let k stand for the number of variables per clause. Um, so a ksat formula phi and an integer uh, I'll call it T, and the question is, is there a truth assignment of the variables um, which satisfies at least T of the clauses? I mean, it's a nice question, right? I mean, so suppose you just can't satisfy all of the clauses at once. Well, a natural question to ask next is how many can you satisfy? So an interesting fact is that whereas, um, remember, for ksat, where k is the number of variables per clause, if k is 2, it's in polynomial time. And it's np-complete for 3 or more. Here, even when there are two things per clause, the maximization version of SAT is already NP-complete. Even though 2 SAT is in P. So in other words, if I give you a 2 SAT formula, and I ask you, can I satisfy all the clauses, you can answer that question in polynomial time. But if the answer is no, and then I ask, well, OK, can I satisfy 9 tenths of the clauses? That's NP complete. I mean, it's, it's good to think about this a little bit, because what it says is um, the it's easy to think, you know, especially because we have phrases like complex systems, right? It's easy to think, well, 
too sad is the system. Either it's complex or it's simple. Well, that's not quite right. The question is, what question are you asking me about it? Some questions about it are easy. Other questions about it are hard. And so um, if, you, if you imagine, again, this high dimensional space of different truth assignments, and you have this landscape which shows um, where the height on the landscape represents the fraction of clauses you can, you've satisfied. Okay. Interestingly enough, it's in polynomial time to tell if any peak in this landscape is at 100%. Nevertheless, if there isn't one up there, finding the highest peak is hard. That's kind of interesting. It suggests that, again, we have this kind of craggy landscape with lots of local optima you can get stuck in, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have a hard search problem here to find the highest peak. It yes. seems like satisfying all the one clause, you just have to run it for each. Case. Yes, I agree. All but one clause is easy. But then all the k is really tough. Exactly. So you know, if you can solve uh, two sat in n squared time, you can you can tell. And it, let's say let's let's use n for simplicity. Let's say there are n variables and n clauses, even though those are generally different. So then telling whether you can satisfy all but one would take n to the what? If the vanilla version of the problem takes n squared. How many, how many of the vanilla versions do I need to solve? N. N, right? N's and then all but two would take n to the fourth. Yep. Times a constant. And all but three would take n to the fifth, and so on. And so the, you know, the problem is that, yes, each one of these is not hard. But um, if I ask, can I solve 0.9 times n, now there's a gap there, which is more than a constant. And now there's an exponential number of different subsets of clauses of that size, an exponential number of ways to, in to satisfy some and to exclude others. And now we seem to be sunk. It's so similar with clique, right? Telling whether there's a triangle, you can do that in n squared time. Telling whether there are four things that are all connected to each other, you can do it n to the fourth, and so on. But telling whether there's a clique of size n over 3, bigger than a constant, seems to take exponential time. All right. So um, between now and Tuesday, uh, read chapter 5. And um, so uh, I'll do one more example when we uh, when we return, and then we'll we'll talk philosophically a little bit about kind of why are some things easy and other things hard. But um, let me just give leave you with this one. So let's look at integrals of the following form: cosine of x1 times theta times cosine of x2 times theta dot 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 cosine of xn times theta, d theta. The question is, is this integral 0 or not? Sorry? Cosine of x1 times theta times cosine of x2 times theta. So, so not actually this parent, right? The first parent. <laughs> exactly well, yeah, I mean, you know. If multiplication has a higher uh, precedence. Anyway, yes. You cosine of x1 times theta times cosine of x2 times theta, okay. and so on. So I give you a list x1 through xn, and I ask you, is this integral 0 or not? That's np complete. Ah. <laughs> All right. See you Tuesday. <laughs>
you're saying like, so I'm not going to go ahead. It depends on how you choose the excess, I guess. If you can give me a list of 10 excess. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,